Good evening and welcome to Face to Face. Tonight we're interviewing the Deputy Premier and Minister for Health, John Thwaites. Welcome, John. Thank you. How are you? A bit warm, but apart from that, very well. First week a bit, uh, bit hectic? Incredibly hectic and uh, I'm waking up early in the morning to start campaigning and I'm not good in the morning, so no. I'm a bit tired. Not a morning person? Not at all, no. Either am I, actually. Not good at it. Um, first off, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and I suppose why you actually decided to go into Parliament. What motivates you know you to go into Parliament? Well, I live in St Kilda with my partner Melanie and our little boy Jack and a friend Ken who lives in our house, mm -hmm. and uh, we love living in St Kilda, great area to live. And I've got involved in politics through local government. I was on the uh, South Melbourne Council. Uh, Melanie. Uh, was on the St Kilda Council, so we got to meet each other through local government. Okay. And uh, I got involved on a number of local issues, uh, which I guess environmental issues, planning issues, that sort of thing, and got into politics that way. And, there's, and planning issues are still big issues, aren't they? Big issues in that electorate too, in your electorate of Albert Park. Yeah, they certainly are. In uh, Albert Park, well, right along the foreshore, people were very concerned about the proposals under the previous government to have what were really uh, Gold Coast style yeah. developments, 20-storey uh, buildings. There was the big fight about the ESPY yeah. uh, hotel. And uh, I think one of the best things I was able to do as planning minister was to put height controls on the foreshore and stop that sort of high-rise development. Mm. Yes, it's a good thing too. Now, when you were in opposition, you uh, tried to introduce a private members bill to, along the lines of the same-sex relationships bill. Um, the Liberals refused to let it be tabled. Why do you think they did that? Well, I think they thought it would be unpopular. And there were quite a few uh, Liberal backbenchers who were very opposed to any sort of uh, legislative reform uh, for gay and lesbian issues. Uh, I believed it was really necessary. There were, I think, uh, 10, 15 acts that were just clearly discriminatory. And the Equal Opportunity Commission had already recommended that there should be legislative reform, but uh, the Kenner government weren't doing anything. Mm. Yeah, they wouldn't step up, would they? They just they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't because uh, we were quite surprised. We thought yes, okay, it'll get debated and at least the issue will get raised, but uh, it didn't proceed any further. So, but I wanted to get it up as a private members' bill. But I would have been very happy if the then government had introduced it themselves. Mm. But they just didn't even allow it to be second read. No. Uh, but we we put it forward. Uh, I went out. Uh, and announced it publicly. I think there was a lot of support from uh, within uh, the gay and lesbian communities. And as a result of that, I think it got on the agenda. And so when we came into government, we were able to implement it pretty quickly. Well, you were instrumental in, in getting party policy changed, weren't you, to, to actually accommodate that, to, to give some real framework to that. That's where the bill originated from. Is that, is that right? That, that is right. And uh, I'm really pleased that the Labor Party did get behind that so quickly and we were able to pass that early on. We introduced changes to the Equal Opportunity Act mm -hmm. and a whole raft of other acts. Uh, if you recall, the Equal Opportunity Act had some language in it, it which was yes. uh, unfortunate. Really unfortunate. And so I think it's about sometimes changing the culture in these things. And when you get out there, put your argument, uh, the culture changes yes, and I'm really pleased that it has. Yeah. Okay, now recently at the Positive Living Centre you launched the first statewide strategy for HIV. Uh, first off, I mean obviously you're committed, you know, as, as, as the Health Minister but as the Deputy Premier, Deputy Leader to, to see that through, to have that implemented if you return to government? Well I am and there are some concerning uh, factors. Uh, we do see quite a significant rise in uh, the rates of HIV infection yeah. uh, between 99 and 2000, 2001. It's plateaued off somewhat now, but that rise is very serious and we are seeing a rise in a number of sexually transmitted diseases. So I'm very concerned that we have to keep uh, emphasising the safe sex message. We have to have adequate research. Uh, we have to have adequate surveillance. And we have to have wide health promotion programs, and mm -hmm. that's what the uh, policy yeah. recommends. Yeah, because I mean, one of the, uh, I suppose, the fact that there is actually a strategy is important, and there hasn't been one previously. Um, is it the sort of thing that would be would be reviewed every year or every couple of years in well, terms of how it's going? We need to implement the recommendations. I don't mm -hmm. think we need another review now. I think we know what needs to be done now. It's a matter of getting out there and doing it. Yep. We need to 
uh, as I said, get the message across. We're doing that in a number of uh, different venues. And I guess what is very critical is to ensure that the community and, uh, and all the various uh, interest groups are actively involved yeah. in, in not only consultation but actually determining what the strategy should be. Okay. Now, youth suicide um, doesn't, you know, the figures don't ever seem to actually decline, and particularly in rural areas, as it relates to same sex attracted youth. What's the government done there, you know, to try and understand that and, and, and pull back those figures? You know, it's such a tragedy. One of the major things that I wanted to do as Health Minister was to uh, make inroads, as you say, on that youth suicide, and there are really disturbing links uh, mm. with young people, uh, mental health and possible discrimination on the basis of uh, their sexual uh, orientation. And so, as a government, we put uh, half a million dollars into, okay. uh, which is obviously a very substantial amount of money, mm. into youth suicide programs that are uh, linked to um, young uh, people who, uh, I guess, go through adolescence and may have different views about their sexuality. Mm. And so, and we're also, I think it's important, we're doing it in Bendigo and in the eastern suburbs. We're not just focusing on this in the city, inner city uh, because we know that people all over the state mm. uh, who are going to have different views. Um, gays, lesbians, as they're growing up, they need to have the programs there to have some sort of support for them. Mm. But we also need good research yeah. and we need to know what we're doing works. Now, I am pleased to say that across the whole youth suicide area, we're beginning to see some improvement. It's not clear how long-lasting that is, but we are beginning to see some improvement. Well, that's a good thing. I mean, any, 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 any reduction in that rate has to be good. Now, does the Labor Party recognise that, that lesbians and gay men have some special health needs and that we really need programs tailored towards that? Um, do you have, you know, it, it, I noticed you, you've recently released result of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Gay and Lesbian Health. What specific things would you like to see happen in the next term of the Brax Government in terms of our specific health needs? Well, there certainly are specific <coughs> health needs. And as you said, uh, the uh, Ministerial Advisory Group released a number of research reports. And some of the key areas, I think mental health is mm -hmm. a, a core area, uh, sexual health, just access to physical health facilities yeah. too, that uh, we do need to ensure that people can access those services without discrimination and with understanding yeah. uh, and that's that's critical and we talked about uh, youth suicide and, and mental health uh, there are particular issues also for example um, uh, early on we were able to provide some extra funds to support lesbian cancer yeah. groups now uh, they're that was are popular with the liberals wasn't it yeah well, and i think some of the <laughs> radio commentators uh, <coughs> and uh, there are areas like that that we do need specific programs for. Mm. Okay. So, moving forward, you did establish the first Ministerial Advisory Committee on Gay and Lesbian Health in Australia, I think. So that was, that was quite groundbreaking. Um, that, that consultation that, that does seem to take place between the community and the government, um, you want to see that continue into the next term? No, absolutely. And I, I really would like to thank everyone who's taken part in that process. Uh, we've had some pretty top people uh, get involved, use their expertise, research expertise, medical mm -hmm. expertise, to provide, I think, really quite groundbreaking research papers. And now we move to the next stage, which is uh, taking actions based upon that research. And we're going yep. through a final consultation phase now uh, to come up with uh, the final re recommendations. Okay. Now, Obviously, the recommendations that, that are contained in the uh, Gay and Lesbian Health Plan, um, they're going to be folded into policy, so that will actually become uh, part of the health policy of, of the government as it moves, as it moves forward? That, that's right. I mean, the purpose of, of this is to have an action-based approach. Mm -hmm. uh, now, obviously, all the, the different recommendations will have to be considered by government, and then government makes a decision, but certainly the direction uh, that has been taken is one that the government is taking and, and I think we're really walking hand in hand on it. Okay. Just briefly before we go to a break, uh, you also just, uh, I think a week or so ago, uh, released the Hepatitis C strategy and, and opened the McFarlane Burnett Centre. Um, what level of funding commitment did that require from the government for that centre? It was, it was a lot of money, wasn't it? It was. I think we put about $7 million into that mm -hmm. and uh, 
that is very important. But the McFarlane Burnett Centre does do a great job, not only in pure research, but in that uh, public health research, uh, getting out there in the community and yes. seeing what works, and not just in Australia, but in the whole uh, region, in the Asia Pacific region. We do have, I think, a duty as Australians in this region to share our expertise with uh, our neighbours, with Asia particularly. If you look at hepatitis C, HIV AIDS, these are areas we've got a great deal of mm. knowledge about and we want to use that knowledge to assist our neighbours. Exactly. I mean, in our near neighbours, people like uh, Papua New Guinea and, and mm. Timor, there is, there's a bit of a, a HIV crisis looming there. Do you see a role for the for the centre there in, in helping them out? Oh, well, uh, it's not in a sense for me to say what the centre should do, but I would hope so, and I think they are getting involved in uh, a number of international areas. But I'd say it more broadly, Australia as a wealthy country yeah. has a duty to assist other countries. Yeah. And, there's a, and, I, and I'd say also, I guess, to the, um, to the gay community that's been involved in a lot of these issues too, that I hope many of them can share their skills, as I know they do, because the area of uh, expertise we have here is not just the medical expertise, it is in community policy making as well. And if you compare our record to say the United States, it is far better. Mm. And it's because we've had that level of community policy yeah. making. Okay. We're going to a break now, so we'll be back after the break. And thanks for watching Face to Face. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Face to Face. We're speaking with John Premier. John <laughs> Premier, sorry, John, <laughs> John Quaid's Deputy Premier and Minister for Health. Give me sack for I know, yeah. And uh, Member for Albert Park. Now, Albert Park is a seat. What, what's your margin there? About six percent. Okay. And uh, there's been a. Uh, well, you've always had had tough battles in that seat, and you, you seem to be a good local member. People that I speak to around the area, you know, hold you in high regard. What are the, the burning issues for the people in Albert Park? Do you think? I think planning is a very big issue. Uh, people living in Albert Park, living near the foreshore, are very concerned about planning issues. So that's probably been the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. uh, other issues that are quite major, I think, uh, education, that people yep. are concerned about uh, the quality of schools. And we're now seeing a lot of uh, people moving in with uh, children, which we didn't see perhaps five, ten years ago. And what we're really trying to achieve is to make sure they go to public schools in the area yeah. rather than, uh, as has been the tendency, to go to private schools yeah. outside the area. So uh, I think they're the two major ones. Apart from that, you have the full raft of issues. It's a very the mixed, tolerant... And having a lot of people coming in and out of, particularly St Kilda, mm. um, uh, must, I mean, obviously it creates special problems around parking and stuff like that. Um, in terms of the infrastructure in the electric, well, I just say traffic is a huge issue. Oh, right. but I just say it's not the state government's the right. council. Well, the city of Port Phillip yeah. didn't invent the motor car. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, a lot of the high rise that, that's there um, does that create particular needs in the electorate as well? The Ministry of Housing. Uh, mm -hmm. It does, and, and it makes the uh, area quite diverse, which mm -hmm. is good uh, because it is very expensive to buy. It a is. house there now, yeah. and so it's it's lucky that we've got uh, a level of, of Minister of Housing and, and tenants generally, mm. otherwise it would be, uh, I guess, a less interesting, less cosmopolitan mm. sort of area. Okay. Now, the three main achievements of the Brax government for you, what are, the, what are the things that will stand out in your mind that you, know, you can hang your hat on and say, we did that? Well, I think, I guess being a health minister, I'm biased, so... <laughs> <laughs> I think starting to restore confidence in our public hospitals and stopping privatisation in mm -hmm. hospitals that had we not been elected we would have seen hospitals across the state yeah. privatised. We stopped that and we're now building the Austin Hospital, the biggest uh, public hospital mm -hmm. building project in Australia. So that's probably the number one from my point of view and we've got 3,300 extra nurses back into hospitals. Number two, I think education and, and probably uh, the, the government would say education's been our 
our number one priority because if you don't have uh, our young people properly trained and educated, then you're just not going to have opportunities in life and that's critical. And the third one, I suppose, is a more general one, which has been to open up government. Uh, as someone I think I saw today about the debate, uh, at least you can have a debate in Victoria these yes. days. Uh, under a previous administration, if you weren't part of the, the, the small club, uh, mm -hmm. you were totally excluded. And in fact, you had uh, TV stations that were banned, radio stations that were banned, people that were sacked for speaking out, that sort of thing. And that's a more general change, but if you think about Victoria now, I think it is a bit more uh, open uh, and democratic than it was three years ago. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, a, I suppose, a feeling, as you say, people are much more prepared to, to speak out, and, and the government certainly, you know, has been much mm. more prepared to listen. Uh, there's been a criticism, I suppose, some people have said that the government has referred a lot of stuff to committee, but we've seen a result of that particularly in gay and lesbian issues, mm. that there's been substantial legislative reform and, mm. and programs introduced. Um, how difficult is it sort of, I suppose, asking people all the time what they want and then implementing that into policy? How difficult is getting that mix right? Well, I think it's interesting that our political opponents make such a big deal mm. of this and say how terrible it is to consult. You gave the example there, uh, the reform of the um, Equal Opportunity Act and the various acts that were amended. Well, that followed a review. Yes, that's that's true. We did consult, but is that such a bad thing? No, I don't think so. Uh, no. you know, we wouldn't have had uh, the legislation unless we talked to people. Mm -hmm. I think you do better if you do talk, if you listen, and then you act. And that way, you're going to get a better outcome. Yeah, exactly. Because I think people want to be heard and they, they want to be considered in that. With the, uh, just to go back a bit to the, to the Gay and Lesbian Health Plan, um, over a period of time, that's that's going to make some change. Do you what do you see in the future? You know, some issues that might be coming up. Obviously, HIV infection rates. You know, we've talked about is, is a focus. But are there some health issues that you can see coming up for the general community as well that that, that are going to need to be addressed for the whole community? Yeah, I think there are. Um, I think obesity um, mm -hmm. is is an important one. I mean, I say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're all right. You're, you're fine. But I'm under tall. I'm under tall. Yeah, right, that's right. But uh, no, but you. Yeah. Seriously, uh, for younger people, I'm talking about. Mm. Uh, we are seeing a doubling of the obesity rates, yeah. and if that goes on, we're going to see diabetes, we're going to yeah. see heart disease, even cancers. And so, it's critical that we try to get people eating better and exercising more. And okay. that's why we've mounted a major campaign around physical activity and also about uh, healthy eating. Okay. Now, physical activity. You're a bit of a surfer, aren't you? You like you like to go for a surf. Where do you like to surf? Uh, well, my parents live at Port Lonsdale, okay. near Geelong. So I like to surf uh, there or wherever I can. Okay. And how often do you get to do that? Not often enough, uh, but every now and then I sneak, sneak one. Okay. And uh, if, I have, if I have a couple of days off, uh, that's what I'd normally, I'd normally do. Mm -hmm. I'll go up to Queensland sometimes. I find it a bit cold here in winter. It does. It does get a bit yeah. cold. Um, okay, now I just want to go back to the, the youth suicide because we had uh, Susan Davies on earlier and she, she talked about that as well mm. in a previous show. Um, given the balance between metropolitan and rural in terms of that program but also other programs, um, there seems to be a lot more money being spent in rural areas, particularly on public health infrastructure. How do you work the budget out for that? Because obviously there's a huge need in Melbourne but also in the regions. There's a, how, how do you balance that? Well, that's what government's all about. It's about uh, priorities. And we believed we had to redress uh, what was an imbalance. We had to give uh, country and regional Victoria back a fairer share. Because under the Kennett years, when you probably remember Jeff Kennett called country Victoria the toenail yes. of the state. And uh, we had Susan Davies on the show. And I think the fact that she was elected in what had been a very safe mm. liberal seat is an example of uh, people were just had enough, they were yeah. fed up in regional Victoria. So we've had to take money and put it back into uh, regional and country Victoria. Now I think we're also putting quite an emphasis on the suburbs yeah. and uh, there are areas of, of Melbourne that have been really neglected for some years that we now feel deserve to have a, a, a fairer share of the resources. Okay. And I think part of that's been the, if I get the term right, the public-private partnerships. Um, there's been a, a new hospital opened recently, I think, in Berwick. 
uh, that's one of those. How does that how does that fit in with the the health plan for the state? Is it something that is just to perhaps plug a particular gap in there, or is it an ongoing thing? Well, Berwick is the fastest growing area of Melbourne, that South East Corridor, so it does need a hospital. And we've now uh, signed up and, and started for a new hospital. It's not completed yet, but we've started that. And as you said, it's a public-private partnership, but that means that the private sector build the hospital, mm. but the public sector operate it. Okay. And that's the clear distinction between us and the Liberal Party. But we don't believe the private sector should be operating public hospitals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You also spoke about the 3,300 nurses back into the system. Um, over the next three years, uh, how many more nurses do you think need to be recruited to replace the wastage and, you know, obviously, you know, for the growth in population? About a half of those nurses were needed not uh, just for for growth, but just to fill vacancies, yeah. to fill the fact that, uh, well, the Kenner government had sacked 2,000. So we had to get about a half of them back in there just so we had a reasonable nurse to patient ratio. Mm. In the future though, we'll need to continue to employ more nurses and we're employing three, four hundred a year more nurses to meet the growth in demand on the system because of the ageing of the population. Okay. And recruiting those, I mean, obviously, you know, there's demand all around Australia and all around the world. Um, do you recruit like in Victoria or is it national or, or where do you find this many nurses on a regular basis? I mean, well, what we've done is actually go back to <coughs> uh, a pool of, pe of nurses who'd left nursing and okay. got them so. to come back into the system. People talk about recruiting from overseas, but everyone is trying to recruit overseas nurses. Uh, the reality is right around the world there's a shortage. Mm. So putting much effort into travelling the world looking for nurses isn't likely to pay off. We think it's better to recruit back nurses that have left and are doing other things, but we would like to see the Commonwealth Government train more nurses through universities. Yeah. At the moment, uh, we're just not training enough, and we are now training less nurses than we did a decade ago in our universities, despite the fact that uh, the demand for nurses has gone through the roof. Okay, as a special treat for ministers and shadow ministers, they actually get uh, to ask me the final question of the show. So, is there a question you'd actually like to ask me before we close for this evening? Well, I suppose I could ask you, <laughs> what do you see as the, the major challenge facing the gay community? I think uh, retaining our, our sense of pride that we uh, got through the same-sex legislation, building on that, um, equality and justice, but actually giving people the opportunity to be themselves and for the community and government and, and all the institutions that, that we work with and work for, um, giving us that, that credibility and respect. So I think for me that's probably uh, what I'd like to see for the future. You practised that answer. I did, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much for being on the program, John. It's been a real pleasure. Good luck in Albert Park thanks. and good luck for the election. And uh, hope to have you on again real soon. Hope so. Thank you. Enjoy.